All right, we started there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're actually going to have you uh, put a bookmark there real quick and flip back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. And I'm preaching a sermon tonight. It's called Be a Man, Not a Male. Be a man, not a male. Obviously, this is directed towards men. And the reason why I say be a man, not a male, is because, you know, first of all, there's only two genders Amen. that exist Amen. in the world. You have male and female. That's right. Right? And you're born one or the other. You're born either male or female. The problem with our culture, though, is that we got a lot of males, but not a lot of men. Amen. We got a lot of males and not, not, not a lot of men. And I've been preaching, I've been hitting on this a little bit uh, recently, um, you know, regarding marriage and, and authority structure and things like that with women and men. And we're going to be going over that again today. And it's really important to go over this stuff in our society because it's been just turned on its head and so backwards. Yeah. Okay. And the whole purpose is because this is coming straight out of the Bible. This is the light that shines from the word of God showing us how we ought to behave and it doesn't get more basic than men and women right. right i mean a man should be a man and a woman should be a woman and god has designed them differently God has created them differently for different purposes different job functions and you know if you're going to be happy in your life if you're going to be happy in your marriage then you ought to try your best to fit the mold that god created you in Amen. if he made you to be a male be a man that's right Right? You don't want to try to identify as something else. Don't try to identify as some other part of creation. You're not a cat. You're not a dog. You're not a woman. Okay, you're a man. And vice versa. Right? He created you as a woman. And, you know, as a man, you should try to be masculine. Masculine. I know. This is, look, we're getting real complicated tonight. Try to stay with me. Okay? And, and women... You should try to be feminine, right? That which pertains to females. I preached a sermon years ago at Word of Truth. It was called, I am a feminist. <laughs> Why I am a feminist. And I am a feminist if you define it as women who act like females. I love it when women act like females. And they have feminine qualities. And they, and they have godly feminine qualities attributes. I am all for that. I am not a masculist where I try to make women more like men. I want women to be like women and men to be like men. The way that God made everything. Now, one of the things that you have to understand as a man is your role that God has created, not me, not anyone else, but God has created a role for men and women. And specifically here, we're going to see with husbands and wives, and it goes all the way back to the first man and woman to walk the earth, Adam and Eve. Okay. All the way back to creation, this is how God made things. And it hasn't changed. Genesis 3.16, okay, this is what happened as a result of sin. We don't know exactly how God had a plan for child rearing and things like that prior to sin. But it doesn't matter because we're not living in that time we're not Adam and Eve. Don't know what his plan was. But from Genesis 3.16 on, this has been the plan. Until we get new bodies. When we have glorified bodies, then that'll change again. Okay, but in the meantime, we've got bodies of flesh on this earth. Men and women, this is how God made it. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, and Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children... And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Look, you don't have to like it. You could blame Eve for it. But God commanded that the result of that sin, one of the things, is that your husband is going to rule over you now. The result of that sin. And that's where it comes from. But, but 
all throughout scripture it's consistent that men are put in an authority role men are in the job of leadership in the home okay the husband is the head of the home going all the way back to Genesis 3 16 where God says you know what your husband's going to rule over you and this didn't just apply to Eve it applied to all of womankind just like Adam's you know, uh, punishment of by the sweat of your brow, you're going to work, right? Now you're going to have to toil and labor and do everything to provide. You still got to do that, men. Okay, and that's, that's getting into part of being a man as well as dealing with being the provider and being the authority in the house. But just to continue with this one point, uh, flip back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 where we started. 1 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Again, another reference to the head of the woman being the man. The man is the figure that's in authority, that's in charge. I know we have a society and a culture that tells you that you have to do things, and it's basically you each have a vote, and that... You know, no one really has more authority than the other person in the home, but that's simply not true according to God-given rights. God has given us, you know, particular rights and and, uh, particular realms of of authority and where we need to be. But, um, you know, the world's going to tell you something different. We started in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to look through some of these... um, attribute or these rules regarding um, pastors and deacons but again it's going to tell us the same exact thing you say well I'm not a pastor I'm not a deacon the rules that apply to pastors and deacons it's just it's it's the same attributes that everybody ought to have it's just hey if you don't have these things you can't be in that position but really everybody should strive to to fit this mold and this model of at least being able to fill that role First Timothy chapter 3, verse number 4, the Bible reads, One that ruleth well his own house. This is talking about someone who wants to be a bishop. He has to rule his own house well, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So in order to take care of the church of God, you need to be able to rule well in your house. Over and over again, have we seen a consistent theme here? He's going to rule over thee. I have the woman know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. You know, one that ruleth well his own house. 1 Timothy 3.12, then for the deacons, let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own houses well. It is God's authority structure to put the man in authority at home. Period. It's indisputable in Scripture. The Bible says in Isaiah 3 that when women are ruling over you, basically, it's a curse. Isaiah 3.12 says, as for my people, children are their oppressors. Right? I mean, I mean, how backwards is that when children are oppressing you? Right? Like as, as an adult, as an elder, whatever, when you have children oppressing you, that's backwards. That's not the way things are supposed to be. That's the world turned on its head. It says, children are the oppressors and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. And who's, who's leading them? The women. The women ruling over them. That's backwards. It's not the way God designed it. That's the way things are going today. Okay? But that's not the way that God intended it. And I'll tell you what, that's why I don't care how libertarian or republican or whatever you follow for your political ideology... I'm not going to vote any women in the office to have that position of authority over the man. Because that's not what God intended for them to do. That's how God made women. And it's not because I think women are stupid. It's not because I don't think women aren't capable of doing things. I just think that God didn't design them to be in that role. And as we're going to see, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're in chapter 3. This is consistent throughout Scripture. And if you think that this is some anti-woman sermon, you don't understand the Bible. Because the Bible is not anti-woman. It's anti-making women men and making men women, but it's not anti-woman. 
The Bible says that we're supposed to give honor unto the woman as unto the weaker vessel. That men ought to love their wives as their own self, as their own body. That that is a husband's job. It's not demeaning or demoralizing to say this is not what God made you to do. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the fact that people just don't like being told, oh, there's something I can't do. I want to do that then. Well, don't have that spoiled brat attitude with God. Because you're going to be the one that ends up miserable. You're not going to do anything against God. You're just going to make yourself and everyone around you miserable trying to do things that God didn't intend for you to do. And this isn't, you know, everyone's going to be able to benefit from the sermon, men and women, even though the title is Be a Man, Not a Male. But I, I'm preaching so hard on this and trying to drive this point home because men do need to understand that you have God-given authority in your home. And at the end of the day, you are responsible for how your family operates. The problem, see, everyone thinks like, oh, man, men have it so great. They're, you know, they're the ones that are in charge, and they have all this authority. You know what, though? With, with the great authority comes great responsibility, and you're the one that has your neck on the line for your whole family. So it's not just, oh, man, everything's great. I'm king, and everyone has to serve me and everything else. Hey, when there's a problem with your family, you're responsible. It is a burden to bear because God's going to hold you accountable for how your wife behaves, Amen. how your family behaves, how your children behave because you are the one at the top in the family. And it makes sense too. I mean, if you think about it from like a business perspective or anything else, at the end of the day, yeah, obviously people can all have their own sin and their own problems. But ultimately, who does the responsibility have? You know, the people who are at the top in charge bear the most responsibility for everything being done beneath them. That's right. Just the way it works. But Brother Peter, your job, yep. you got a problem with an employee at work, who are they going to turn to? They're going to turn to you right. to fix the problem, to take care of the problem, to deal with it. And if things just aren't, if, if, if you go to your job and nothing's being done the way it's supposed to be done, are they going to be more likely to fire everybody beneath you or fire you? Me. You're responsible. That's right. Right? It's accountability. And men, to be a man, you have to take on that accountability for your family and treat it seriously and not be flippant about it. It's not enough just to be, you know, the head of the house in title only. You need to take ownership of that role. That's right. Now, you need to do so rightly, appropriately, and, and, you know, I don't think it's the best idea for you to just become this, you know, uh, um, you know, this authoritarian dictator the way that a lot of people might have in their minds, like this Hitler at home, right? Now, you may have the authority to do so from Scripture. You do. Okay, because the way that the Bible talks about the submission of the wife to the husband should be in everything. And the only higher authority would be, uh, you know, God himself. Meaning that women have to obey God rather than man, just like everyone else does. But in any area where the husband's not making you break God's commands... You, that falls under their, their scope of authority, right? So um, that's the way it plays out in Scripture. But, men, you know, you need to um, take that role seriously. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 8, I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So this is also a, a balance anyways of God. God wants men to pray everywhere. It's not unmanly to pray. Amen. It's not something that, that you know, and, and we'll get into this a little bit more. You know, one of, one of the attributes that the Bible defines about men is being strong and having strength. Yeah. But it is not a sign of weakness to pray to the Lord. Amen. 
it's actually strength, and it's going to be spiritual strength, and it's going to be strength that you can help provide for your family. If you've got the strength of God that you're asking for on your family, that's way stronger than you can ever be. If you're asking for his guidance, his power, his help on things in your life and in your family's life, you better believe you ought to be praying. And it's not weakness, it's humility. But that's the first part there about men praying everywhere. Look at verse number 9. It says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly way, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. So again, there's this reference to the authority being with the man and that women aren't supposed to usurp or take over that authority from the man uh, un unrightfully so because the man is the one that has the authority. And the Bible also states elsewhere, and we've gone over this before, that, it, that the woman is supposed to learn in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I don't think I have it in my notes uh, today, or maybe I do. Yeah, we'll get to that later. Asking her husband at home. All right, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So all of this scripture, right, we go over this to just demonstrate how God has structured, you know, definitely the home. Husbands, wives, relationships, and, and there's no doubt about it that men are to be in authority at home. And it's not just a title. When you're the authority in the home, you need to be the authority in the home. And you use that responsibly, but you still are the authority at home. And, you, and look, if it's not the way things have been, if it's not the way that things have gone for a long time and you've been used to doing things a certain way or you haven't really acted as the authority, if you want to get right with God, you better start being the authority. And it just means some changes. And part of being the authority means you make decisions. Okay? And, this, and look, this needs to be taught on, on men being more man, man like and power to be a man is making decisions. And understand, you're not always going to make the right decision every single time. And women have to understand that too. But God has made the, the man to be in charge and to make the decisions at home. And as a man, I understand this because I could get lazy too and just say, well, I don't really care, whatever, and just kind of just say, blow it off and just say whatever to everything. And your wife's trying to figure out, well, what should we do here? What should we do there? Ah, whatever. I don't care. Be careful of that. Be careful of that, of doing that too much. Obviously, there's some little minor things where it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't mean you're not running your house, right, over the smallest minutia. But be careful of allowing that to just, you're not making any decisions for the home. Because you're just like, oh, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. Just make the decisions. If you don't care, then just make one. And if your wife's asking you, Right? Hopefully she's not asking you just to condemn you for making the wrong decision. So she's asking you, she's asking you for a reason. Right? Just make the decision. Go with it. Be the authority in the house. Just, just start doing it. Matthew chapter 4. Turn to go to Matthew chapter 4. I just want to point something out to you real quick here. We know that Peter, the apostle Peter, in scripture, that he was married. He had a wife. Right? Because we see the story of when... It says that, that Peter's wife's mother laid sick, sick of a fever, right? And Jesus healed her so that the fever left her. But that shows that he was married. He had a wife. And men, if you want to be a man in your home, okay, you make the decisions of what you're going to do. And you don't need to go and ask your wife permission to do stuff. And dead sure when it comes to serving the Lord. When, when Jesus said to Peter and Andrew, hey, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, as you see here in Matthew 4, 18. You know, you know what's missing from the story? Where Peter said, wait, hold on a second, Jesus. I need to go home and ask my wife first. 
Matthew 4, 18, And Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. But if I just leave my job, my wife's going to be mad at me. I can't just stop working and, and go off and, and follow Jesus. What would she say? Hey, this is the right thing to do. We're going to do it. I'm going to do this. It's being a man at home. Now look, it's not to be insensitive to the wife, but there's some things that when it's the right thing to do, you just need to do it. Okay, and you don't ask for permission. There's nothing wrong with keeping your wife informed on everything that's going on. And showing respect in that sense of going, okay, well, hey, here's what's going on. Here's the plan. Here's what we're doing. But this is an important part of marriage that everyone needs to understand, women and men, that the wife is supposed to be the man's helper and not the other way around. Because when you go back to creation again, and turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 2, we're going to see that God made the woman. When he created woman, it wasn't so the man can serve the woman. Is the other way around. 1 Corinthians 11.8, the Bible says, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. The woman was created for the man. That was, that's why she was created in the beginning, and to begin with, was, was to be created for the man. And again, this isn't to be demeaning and it's not if you have the right biblical perspective on this and God's view on it God doesn't love men more than he loves women God just gave them different roles he created man in his own image and then he created a woman to be with the man and to help the man and that you know the two that are joined together and become one flesh as husband and wife can then, I believe, end up doing so much more for the Lord as as one. And you need to, if you're gonna if you're gonna have families and and reproduce and bear fruit, one person can't do it alone. You need help. Amen. And especially if it's gonna be done right. Amen. Someone needs to raise children and someone needs to work and provide. You can't do it all. You, you, can't be, you can't be raising men, can't be raising a one-year-old that can't do anything for itself and be out in the field toiling and working and bringing in and reaping and, you know, and doing what you need to do to support, support a family. You can't do it. And vice versa. Right? God had a great design from the beginning. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. The Bible says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now, meet means suitable. He says, I'm going to make a, a, a helper that's suitable for Adam. Because it's not good that he's just here by himself. He needs someone to be with him. He needs a helper. So, this is when... The beast started to be creating, right? He just brings these beasts before Adam, saying, okay, in verse 19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whoso and whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. So he starts naming all the animals. Verse 20 says, And Adam gave names to all cattle and the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. So none of the animals in God's creation is suitable to be a partner for, for Adam. The closest thing might be the dog, you know, man's best friend, but it's still not quite the right helper that God had in mind for Adam to really be that, that lifelong partner that, that a man needs to have. And then it says, verse 21, and, Lord God, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh and said thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man cleave his father and his, excuse me, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. That was the appropriate, perfect help meet for Adam. Suitable for him. 
fits together great. Man and woman, that is the ideal partnership that God has created. But don't forget, like it says in 1 Corinthians 11, you know, that the woman was created for the man. There is a job that God has given unto men that women need to help with. For example, I would never be able to do even everything I do here at church all by myself without my wife helping. She doesn't have an official role in the church, but she supports me. In order for me to do this work, and I I believe that's one of the reasons, even though it's not specifically mentioned as to why the, you know, the, the, the elder, the bishop needs to be the husband of one wife. One of the things that you get is you got to be able to at least demonstrate that you could run your house. If you can't run your house, you can't rule your house well, you can't, you can't, you know, how are you going to be able to run a church? But also there's so much work involved in running a church. You know, I need help. Just like I need help. There's a lot of work involved in raising a family and providing for a family. You need help with that. And there's nothing wrong with being in the role of a helper. And think about that for a minute, too, even though I wasn't even going to go into this. But, you know, for the people that just are bristling and hating every word that's coming out of my mouth about women's roles. View the woman as someone who's ministering or serving her husband. What did Jesus come to do? He came as a servant. He came in the form of a servant. He came to minister unto other people. Don't tell me that you're too good to have a job and have a role of serving and ministering. But it wasn't too good for Jesus. right? He wasn't too good for it. If he could do it, can you humble yourself to do it? If the Lord God humbled himself... Enough to become a man and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? Can you humble yourself to be obedient unto your husband? Is it really that bad? Or you can take the right attitude and approach and say, you know what? Instead of being bitter about this, I'll embrace it and actually get joy from serving someone that I love anyways. Right? I mean... You should love your spouse. You chose to marry them. Right? You love them, right? Don't you want to help them out and do what's best for them? Oh, that's such a horrible thing. Right? People just hear it and it just sounds so bad. But it's like, don't you love your husband? Don't you want to help him out and what he's doing? Why would that sound so weird and bizarre? And the same thing, you know, from the husband, you love your wife, don't you? Yeah, you're an authority, but I mean, don't you love your wife? So the decisions that you make ought to reflect your love for your spouse. You should be doing things with her in mind. And women need to trust their husbands to make those decisions. Because that's the role that God has put them in. And even personal things, you know, I, I've talked with my wife about this quite a while in the back, in, in the, I don't know, a long time ago, but just in general, when it comes even to health issues, right? It's like, yes, I know this is real personal. This is your body or whatever, right? Like we're talking about health decisions, but the husband has the authority over everything. And sometimes it'd be hard because that's so dear and close to you. But you have to get to the point where you understand, you know, my husband loves me. Like, I don't want my wife gone. I want her there with me, fully functioning the best. I care about her health, probably even more than my own. And that's the love that a husband ought to have for their wife, where you love them that much. I mean, you care about them more than yourself. It's a self-sacrificial love. That's what Ephesians 5 teaches. For men to have that love for their wife, they're willing to give themselves for her. Just as Christ is willing to give himself for the church. So when you have a husband and wife in their proper roles, hey, everything can work out great and can really come together synergistically where everybody is being blessed, being in their role. 
Because when the wife is supporting the husband, being obedient, let him make all the rules, you don't have as much conflict, things can move ahead, and you can get uh, uh, the best out of the husband and his role and his job and making him be able to produce and get, you know, that much more efficiently because the, the wife is helping out. At the same token, then, the husband's loving the wife and doing things that reflect that love so that the wife has no reason not to just be obedient and submissive anyways because she can see her husband's taking care of her. Her husband loves her. And he's doing, you know, when you've got that going on between both parties, that's a blessed marriage. Now, obviously, nobody's perfect. Everybody falls short. Everybody gets in the flesh. Everybody ends up doing things outside of their roles. Okay, but that's why we're preaching on this. So that we can try to do better, right? So that everyone, and specifically in this sermon, it's, it's still, it may not sound that way, but it is more geared for men. Because no matter what, and, and this is a important point too, I've gone over this many times in the past, but... No matter what your spouse does, what's right for you from God and the role that he gave you is still right for you from God. So what I mean by that is, husbands, you have the authority, you're in charge, and you're responsible for your family. Say, but my wife's not being obedient. She's not being submissive, as the Bible says. You still have to love her. You still have to love her like Christ loved the church. That's still your job. That's still what the Bible says for you. No matter how disobedient, no matter how much your wife is, is you know, against you, even if that's, if that's the case, that doesn't change what's right for you in God's eyes. And vice versa. Well, my husband is a total loser, and he doesn't do anything, and he doesn't, he doesn't even have a job, and he just sits at home and smokes pot and drinks beer and whatever, right? That doesn't change the role that God gave you either. It really doesn't. It might, it's going to make things a lot more difficult for you at home when someone's just really out of balance with their role. Right. It makes things difficult. No doubt about it. But it doesn't change your role. But I'll submit this to you also, is that the, the more you can try to fit your role, the more you'll end up helping your spouse fill their role. The more submissive that women can become to their husbands, the more it's going to help your husband be a leader and make decisions. When you stop doing those things and kind of help them to make the decisions. And vice versa, when a husband can fill his role a little bit better of loving his wife and being the authority, it's going to help the wife find her role of being submissive as well. Okay, so both sides need to be uh, you, you need to do what you are supposed to do according to the Bible, according to God, right? You're in Genesis 2, flip over to Genesis 18. We're going to see a good example here of Abraham being a man, Okay? And Abraham just being this model example of a godly man in the home. Genesis 18, we're going to start reading verse number 1. The Bible reads, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them, from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So here we see, first of all, that Abraham is a humble man. He's a hospitable man. He's caring about people and he's, and he's willing to serve. He's willing to minister. But you know what? Abraham is still a man. Abraham's no wimp. Remember when, when Lot got in trouble and, and got carried away captive? Remember how, how Abraham is the one who got his house in order. He got his house together with like 300 people and destroyed these, you know, rescued Lot right. from the, the five kings that had won the battle against the four kings, right? Like beats this army with 300 people and is able to rescue Lot. He wasn't a wimp. Yeah. 
He was a tough guy, but you know what? You could be a tough guy and still be humble and still treat people with respect and treat people with hospitality. That doesn't make you any less of a man. And we see here these strangers, these visitors that are passing by. They're traveling. He's probably out, you know, in the middle of nowhere or whatever. And he's going, okay, hey, great. Here's someone, you know, come on in. Let me take care of you. Let me give you something to eat. Verse number um, four says, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, you shall pass on, for therefore you come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. Right? You're saying, okay, great. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll take a break. And look what Abraham does. Verse 6 says, And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. He goes in and commands his wife to make a meal. Hey, we've got guests. Make a meal. We don't see Sarah going, but I'm right in the middle of something right now. You're just gonna, your friends are going to have to wait. We also don't see him tiptoeing in there and going, uh, excuse me. Would it be okay? There's a couple people out front. I think they're a little hungry. Do you think you could make something for them? It's okay if you don't. I don't. <laughs> no. He goes into the tent. He says, make ready quickly three measures of meal. Okay? Now, he's not being a jerk about it. He's just being direct. Yeah. He's, just, he's just saying, hey, this is what we need done. Okay? Make this food. We've got company. We've got guests. You make this food. And then he goes off and does his own thing. I mean, he goes and, and kills the kid. You know, he's off on the grill. Right. On the barbecue, and, and you know, his wife's preparing the rest of the food. So Abraham ran under the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. So they're working together, but he's in charge, and he's saying, you do this, I'm going to do this, and we're going to be hospitable to these people that have come into our presence. Amen, that's good. That is a godly man. Amen. That is a real man. And then, of course, he gives it to them, and he stands by them while they eat. And he's just being a good, proper host. Jump down to verse number 19, and we see where God gives Abraham basically the same credit about being a good man, a good husband, a good father when it comes to ruling his house as men are commanded to do. Verse number 19, the Bible says, For I know him. This is when God's deciding whether or not he's going to let Abraham know what's going to happen because Genesis 18 is right before Genesis 19 Genesis 19 God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone out of heaven and 18 he runs into Abraham first as they're on their way there to, to basically save Lot again Lot needs rescuing so they go to save Lot because he's around all these stinking Sodomites which is a whole other sermon in and of itself you're putting yourself in a lot of danger when you decide to live in Sodom right. and you find yourself needing to be just bailed out every time But I'm not going to go down that path today. Verse number 19. The Bible says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. He will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. He says, You know what? I know, I know my servant Abraham. He's a manly man, he's a godly man. He's going he's gonna to instruct his house and he's going to command his house and they're going to serve the Lord even when he's gone. He was the right leader. He wasn't just taking a title and just saying, oh, you just have to respect. You know, He walked it. He lived it. He commanded and he commanded with authority. And man, if you want to be a good leader in the home, one, you got to lead by example. And two, you got to have integrity and you got to be, you know, the type of leader that people are going to want to follow. Right? So if it's all just about me, 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 that's going to get old pretty quick. And you know what? It's not supposed to be about you, 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 you. For any Christian, for that matter. We need to have a mindset that's focused on other people anyways. But your job is to effectively do that in your house. 
say, how is my house going to be the ideal Christian home? Well, one, we need to serve the Lord. Right? You want to be a godly man? You want to be a godly husband? You want to be a godly father? You better start making sure and, and, and tightening up the ship at home to make sure, one, you're in obedience with the Lord in general on things inside of your house. And you know what that might mean you have to do? It might mean you have to clean the ship. You have to clean house a little bit. You might have to walk through the house and start saying, what is this wicked piece of trash? It's not going to be in this household. You've got pieces of idolatry laying around. You've got smut in the form of, you know, the world's garbage that they're trying to cram down your throat in the house. You might just have to go through and say, this isn't going to belong. This does not belong in my house. This is gone. Whatever the case may be, whatever needs to be done, hey men, you're responsible for that. You are. And you know what? God's given you that authority to draw the line on too. Now he's given, uh, he's given us his commandments. He hasn't left you without instruction on how to do things. But it's there for you to follow and you to determine what's right and what's wrong. And that goes even for anything that's preached from this pulpit... Man, it's your job to decide what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. It's not my job to decide it for you. I'm not going to go into your house and tell you what to do and, and, and you get rid of, you know. You'll never find me doing that. Because that's every man's job in that household to do that. It's not my job. I'm going to do my best trying to instruct you and teach you and say, hey, this is what the Bible says, what Scripture says. You do with it what you will. Amen. But man, it's your job to be that authority in the home. No one else's. And it's not just making the decisions of like what house we're going to buy or things we're going to get or, or whatever, right? The more important area that you need to make sure that you're ruling well is the spiritual side of things in the house. That is the most important thing. I mean, everything falls under your authority and ought, and ought to be taken under your authority to, to make decisions on. But just as you have the, you know, the, the responsibility for your family and how things are turning out, you know what? At the end of the day, too, even with, with children being raised and stuff, guess who's responsible? Now, now obviously, God also puts a lot of, of um, responsibility on the woman because their job is to rear the children. But you know what? Who also is responsible? It's still the man at the end of the day. Even if your wife is, is dropping the ball on raising the children the way they're supposed to be raised, hey, that's your job to manage your wife. To, to raise them right. It's a, lot, it's a big burden. But you need to figure out how you're going to make it work. Being a spiritual authority is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're, again, I think I read this verse recently, a week or two ago. Uh, verse number 34, the Bible reads, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So it's not the woman's job in the middle of churches for you to be like, Wait, can you explain that to me? Or just start asking questions or, or, you know, throwing out the amens and stuff. But if, if you want to learn something, that's, you know, it's your husband's job. Husbands, teach your wives. Yeah. God's given you that responsibility to do that. That's your role. And if you're, you know, don't have a lot of knowledge, you don't have a lot of wisdom, especially in the things of God and things of the Bible, get it. Amen. <laughs> because it's still your job. Amen. Your job hasn't changed. Yeah, that's right. Seek it out. Make it a priority. So that you can rule well spiritually in the house. So that when your wife comes to you with questions, you're not just going, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. If God's saying, if the Bible's saying, hey, this is where the wife is supposed to go to, make sure you can handle that. Now, obviously, no one's going to have all the answers to everything. But you got to take that as your responsibility to be that spiritual leader in the home and to guide your wife and to guide your family and to make sure that you are ultimately teaching them because you're also responsible for that. And it's not enough just to rely on 
pastor of a church in your home. Because your pastor of a church isn't in your home. It shouldn't be in your home. <laughs> it should be in their home, dealing with their family, and you know, you can confirm or not what's being preached at church. Right? It's your job to say to your family, if there's anything that I preach that's wrong, you say, well, Pastor Burson's taught this, but that's not what we believe here. Now, hopefully you never have to do that. But it's still your responsibility. That's why I bring it up. It's your, it's your responsibility to determine if this is right or not. I guarantee you everyone has something they disagree with me about that's sitting in this room. There's going to be something that you don't like that I do or I say or I teach or whatever. But it's up to you to decide what's right and what's wrong. And you have that spiritual authority in your house to make things run the way that you want them to run. But as I mentioned many times, authority means you're responsible. Luke 12. Turn, if you would, to, um, to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. 1 Chronicles 28. Being an authority means you're responsible. The Bible says in Luke 12, 47, And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him will they, add, they will ask the more. God has committed a lot unto men in the home. It's your responsibility. You say, well, I didn't sign up for that. Well, that's just the way it is. You get married, you've signed up for it, taking charge of the home. So that's what God expects of you. And by giving you that authority, there's a lot required of you then. And in order to be a good leader, you need to have resolve, which means that you're not just easily moved and swayed, right? Because it's not always easy to lead at home because we live with imperfect people. You're imperfect. Your spouse is going to be imperfect. But you need to maintain your strength and resolve and dedication to do your job appropriately. You cannot be double-minded. You can't be flip-flopping all the time on things, decisions that you make, and what's right and what's wrong, and just because you're getting pushback from your spouse, just because you're getting pushback from your wife on something, they're going to push back on things. And no, it's not right. They should be able, you know, like if they're just going to be obedient, they're going to be obedient. But it's going to happen. Just like you're not going to rule the best, ideally, all the time either. Okay, but in, in order to deal with all of that, you need to be able to um, endure and to not be double-minded. The Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, right? So you need to be able to make decisions and stick with it. Obviously, if you identify that you've just done something wrong, then you change to what's right. Yeah. And if you catch yourself always making the wrong choice and having to change... You're unstable. Yeah. 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 And that just means you need to get some stability and you need to do some more reading and understanding and growing. Okay? So that you can get to the point where you can make decisions and it's right and you can keep moving forward where you're not just flip-flopping all the time. That's what you're striving for, man. That's where you want to be. You also need to be a man of your word. Yeah, amen. The things that you say need to come to pass. And that's for any leadership, but especially in the home, if people are going to respect you, then they need to understand that when you say something, it happens. You can't just continually let your wife down saying, we're going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do it. And then nothing happens. You're ruining their confidence in you as a leader and to be able to do anything and to even want to be submissive to someone who just can't get anything done. So when you speak, make sure that it's well thought out. And when you say we're going to do something and we're going to do this and we're going to move here, we're going to do this. 
You actually do it. It's only going to, you know, and there's so many reasons that you do that, but obviously even the Bible puts a high emphasis on your word. The things that you say, you know, the Bible says uh, in verse in James 5:12, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath. He's basically saying not to swear, right? They're saying, oh, I swear to God that this is true. I swear to God I'll do that. Or I, you know, don't swear by anything. He says, but let your yea be yea and your nay nay, unless you fall into condemnation. Hey, this isn't even in the context of being a leader and being a husband. But it applies very easily that way when you say, you know what? If you just keep your word, when I say yes, it's yes. When I say no, it's no. That simple. It's not confusing. If you want to be a good leader, you can't have, you know, a bunch of confusion. Well, what do we really do things? You know, this is why I, with, even just with the soul winning times and stuff and, and the way that we operate things here now, there was some confusion going on. You know whose fault that was? Mine. It's my fault. I let things go, just kind of get out of control for too long and not having a really good established way of doing things. That's why I change things today. Because I'm responsible for that. Apply that same type of thing at home, right? With whatever you deal with at home. If things are getting out of control at home. Maybe you're getting too relaxed on, on you know, things you allow your, your children to see or be exposed to. Maybe it's time to say, you know what? We need to change some things around here because I'm in charge of this. And if my children start growing up and just being real worldly and start using a bunch of language that I don't approve of, where are they getting that from? My children start acting a certain way because they've seen it on TV or movies or something else. That's my fault. I shouldn't have allowed them to be exposed to that stuff. And I should have done a better job of teaching them. Tighten it up. And be clear. And say, this is the way things are going to be. And there is no room for doubt or did you really mean that if you can be a man of your word your yay is yay your nay is nay then no one should ever have to question did dad really mean that i know he said that but but i mean really because he says things all the time and then nothing ever happens he says things all the time but then we just do something we just do it anyways you need to have your authority in the house and unfortunately, sometimes establishing authority is unpleasant. It means you actually have to do something about it. But you got to do it. If it means throwing things away, you throw things away. Right? Whatever it is that you just got to get under control in your house, then that is your job and your responsibility. Men, that is your responsibility to be in charge in your house. Strength. First, First Chronicles 28, verse number 20. This is the instruction from a father to a son, from David to Solomon. The Bible says in verse 20, And David said to Solomon his, strong, his son, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. Now, I decided not to because, again, where I could see where I'm at with time already. Go into all the scripture. I've done this in the past on other sermons regarding men and women and stuff like that on the, the high attribute of, of being strong as a man, of having strength. Okay? And I don't mean just physically. I'm talking about probably even more importantly spiritually. But, yes, physically as well. You shouldn't just be a wimp and a weakling as a man. Because yeah. you know what? That's a feminine trait because the Bible says that the woman is the weaker vessel. If you find yourself as the weaker vessel in your marriage as a man, you need to do something about that. I know bodily exercise profited little, but it'll profit you a little bit. It'll profit you more than others if you are finding yourself to be the weaker vessel in the marriage. Okay. And that goes for both physically and emotionally and spiritually. Okay, you need to be the rock. 
You need to be the solid person. You need to be that, that, you know, the person that everybody in your family can rely on and depend on. A real man is like that. Unfortunately, we got a lot of males in our society. You know, the deadbeat dads, the ones that, that are able to have children and, and then they leave. And then they run off and they only care about themselves and they don't take on the responsibility at home and take on the job that they ought to have and have that authority in, in the home and being the man that people can rely on and depend on and trust in and follow the example of a heavenly father who's always there for his children. That's a real man that can, that can reflect the heavenly father, a real father is going to be there for his family and is going to be strong and is going to be a defender and is going to be a protector and is going to be there to provide and protect for his family. That's what a real man does. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Watch ye stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Tying the male attribute to the strength. Right. Hey, be like a man. Be strong. Stand fast in the faith. Don't be shakable. You ought to be unmovable in your faith. You ought to be unmovable in your resolve at home. That's being a real man. And then finally, my last point comes from 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11. You ought to be a real man. You're going to have to put away childish things. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, the Bible says, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Be a man or be a child. Okay, when you become a man, it's time to stop being a child. There's a level of sobriety and seriousness that goes along with your responsibility of being a man. Stop acting like a child. And it makes me sick to see people who are supposed to be spiritual leaders, right? Pastors of churches getting up and dressing like they're a child. Right. Dressing like they're some stinking teenager because they want to look hip and cool and trendy and everything else. Hey, act like a man. That's right. Man. You're not a child. You don't need to win over children by looking like a children and acting like a child. Be a man. That's right. Children ought to respect you because you're a man, not because you're acting like a child. Because you're not going to get respect from children when you act like a child because they're going to act like one of them. Why, would they, why should they respect you? Right. And if you want your wife to respect you, Put away the childish games and the childish things, you know, the, 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 whatever it may be. I don't know. I mean, this, just don't act like a kid. I don't mean you can't play with your kids, right? You can have a good relationship and playing games with your family and playing games with your kids. But there's a difference between that and you just becoming like a child yourself, right? If I go, if I go and play with my, with my boys, and we're building train sets and doing things like that. That's different than my wife just coming in on me and I'm just playing with trains, right? Like I'm just sitting there playing with these toys and there's no other kids around. Like, well, honey, what are you doing? <laughs> oh, just playing. <laughs> be a man. You want your wife to respect you? Be a man. Okay, put away the childish things. There's so much more that you could go into on this topic because the, the, the attack from Satan and his devils has, has just been so focused on the family, on gender roles, on things that are just core, fundamental truths and, and, and fundamental aspects of creation have just been bombarded and under attack. And we need to be the good examples 
of how things work. It's important as ambassadors, as Christians, as people who are claiming the name of Christ, to not have dysfunctional families to show, hey, if you do things God's way, it really does work. Let that be the good example. And look, I know that no one's perfect. Everyone's got their own problems in their families. We're not looking for perfection. It's not what you could, you know, anyone should expect from you. But over time, you ought to be able to demonstrate to people that following things this way yields good, peaceable, joyful fruit when both people are in, when all people in a family are in their proper roles. Because it will. Otherwise, God's a liar. Otherwise, the Bible's wrong when it's explaining the boundaries, the roles, and what jobs you have. Okay? But God's not wrong. We may fall short and be wrong. But let's do our best to get right so that we can be that good example even unto other people from the outside looking in and going, wow, you guys are weird. This is crazy. You know, it's really not that crazy. That's right. I get from people all the time out in the world, oh man, your your wife, like she stays at home, she homeschools, you teach, you know, like, how could you possibly do that? Like, it's just so foreign to people. And I get that. I understand that. But you ought to be able to then, you know, because with, with these types of things, with these types of ways of being an ambassador, it goes beyond just preaching the gospel to people, right? It's, it's, um, and it's not a replacement for it by any means. But it's something that all aspects of your life ought to show and demonstrate the right way, the right path, the light. And where people over time have, you know, it's, and it, it could take decades before people finally realize, you know, you were right about that. Like the people who want to argue about spanking your children. They're going to be all screwed up and you're bringing them to that church and you're hateful and this and that. You know know what, though? I'm going to rest in God's word on how my family's run at home and we'll see how they turn out. But I'm going to trust in this right here because I'm confident you train up a child in the way that he should go and when they're old, they will not depart from it. I'm confident to that. I have been since I had a family and a wife. I'm not perfect, but I'll I'll put our family and our happiness and our existence against any other worldly family out there, regardless of your situation. I don't care how much money you have or anything else. I guarantee you we have a lot more joy in our home. And we're not perfect. My wife's not perfect. I'm not perfect. My kids aren't perfect. But we're using this as our guide. Amen. We're using this as, as the light. And you know what? We do have a lot of joy in our house. Everyone has off days. We, we have a lot of joy in our house. And things work out really well when we can find ourselves doing what we're supposed to be doing. And I'll tell you that from experience. That's, that's, I, this is the authority. But the experience proves this over and over and over again, every single time. This word is true. We should be looking to this word. You want to know how to be a man? You find enough about it in here. You want to know how to be a woman? Find enough about being here. You want to be a husband, father, mother, wife, child? It's all in here. What's right? What's wrong? The more you can follow this better off you will be both here and in eternity let's bow our heads have a word of prayer dear heavenly father lord we thank you so much for giving us such great wisdom on this earth that you've uh, provided your words for us and i pray that you would please help us to um, incorporate these great truths into our lives and lord i know it can be hard to undo a lot of the brainwashing that's been going on uh, from the world and that some of these things may seem really foreign to people God but I pray that you would please just 
show them from your word the truth and, and that um, you'd help us all to to do right, to fill our proper roles. I pray that you please help me as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, to do the roles that you've assigned me to do, dear Lord, and everyone in this room, man and woman, boy and girl, that you'd help us all to, to fill our roles so that we can ultimately, in the end, do the most in service to you. God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.